our YouTube. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Christy Post. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications with the Finger Lakes Trail Conference. Um, this is one of our June uh, FLT Connect events. We have a couple this month. Um, FLT Connect events happen about monthly, sometimes slightly more than that. And there are uh, all kinds of different presentations, um, educational, informational, um, sometimes inspirational. Uh, we had one last month. Uh, it was a panel discussion on people who have completed end-to-end -end hikes of the Finger Lakes Trail. We've had a presentation about ticks. Um, and tonight we have Matt Gallo, who is going to be talking to us about terrestrial invasive species. Uh, but before I hand it over to Matt, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Finger Lakes Trail Conference if you're not familiar with us. Um, the Finger Lakes Trail Conference is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we were founded in 1962. The trail, Finger Lakes Trail itself, was built and is maintained entirely by volunteers. And there's about a thousand total miles of trail. It starts over on the western end in Allegheny State Park at the New York Pennsylvania border and goes across the state to the Catskills uh, Park in the east, ending on Slide Mountain. And then there are branch trails that run north and south, up and down in between, um, totaling about a thousand miles. So we, the majority of our funding comes from membership dues and donations. So um, if you are not a member, I encourage you to look into membership with us and please consider joining or making a gift. Um, donations and membership support literally everything we do, everything from trail work um, to our communications to these kinds of events. Um, so thank you if you are a member or a donor. And again, if you're not, please consider becoming one. Um, so Matt Gallo is here to talk to us tonight about uh, terrestrial invasives. Um, and Matt is the Terrestrial Species Outreach Coordinator with the Finger Lakes PRISM which stands for Partner for Regional Invasive Species Management. Um, he works on invasive species education across the Finger Lakes, and they're currently looking for volunteers, which is why he's talking to us tonight, to help them identify and uh, sort of record uh, 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 invasives across the trail so that they can respond to priority areas. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Um, you are all muted and we ask you, I'm going to leave it to Matt, a couple housekeeping items. Um, if you have questions or comments, put them in the chat. Um, and we ask you to stay muted unless Matt asks you not to. So we're a kind of a small group. So he may say we can unmute for questions. Um, but when you're not speaking, please do mute yourself so we don't get a lot of background noise. Um, so thank you for being here and go ahead, Matt. Yeah, uh, let me just uh, share my screen here. Scooch this over to the side. Is everyone hearing me all right? Be good there? All righty. All right, well, uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming out tonight. Appreciate you all taking the time out of your day to hear me talk tonight. I know it's like a beautiful day outside too. So um, definitely don't blame you for <laughs> wanting to go outside. But um, I'm here to talk about invasive species on the trail and what you guys can do to help us uh, protect our trails from invasive species. And before we go into talking about invasive species, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I know Christy already uh, mentioned a couple things there, but hi again, I'm Matt. I am the Terrestrial Invasive Species Outreach Coordinator for the Finger Lakes PRISM, PRISM being an acronym standing for Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. We are essentially a um, partnership between New York State, uh, specifically the New York State DEC, and um, Hobart and Williamson Colleges with the goal of advancing invasive species management, outreach, and education in the Finger Lakes area. So we specifically cover a 17 county region, as you could see in the map to the uh, left here. Everything from uh, the Rochester area in the west to the Syracuse area in the east. And we are not the only prism. Um, we are one of eight regional prisms in New York State. So there is a prism for Western New York that covers the Buffalo area. And there's a separate prism for the Long Island area, the Catskills, et cetera, et cetera. And these, um, our sister organizations and the Finger Lakes prism are really great ways of tackling um, invasive species 
species on, on a local and regional level. And the reason why we exist in the first place is because invasive species are really one of the biggest ecological problems that we face, especially here in upstate New York. Um, these three pictures, I think, really sum up um, sort of the, the damage and gives you a really visceral feeling as to what the destruction um, invasive species can cause. Uh, the picture in the um, top left here shows an invasive species that if you guys are hiking on, been hiking on the trails recently, you've probably seen, uh, or maybe have had a poop on you before, gypsy moth. Uh, gypsy moth is one of the worst invasive species um, really ever seen anywhere. Um, it's been here for 150 years, and this area in this forested area here is was taken from a plane over Pennsylvania, I believe in the 80s. And you could see all of these brown areas, um, and these brown areas like stretch off into the horizon. We're talking about multiple square miles of land here, um, have all been defoliated specifically by gypsy moth. Gypsy moth, um, without any natural predators, has been able to um, spread its population rapidly across North America. And with that, the caterpillars are able to um, eat all the leaves of the trees completely, completely remove them. Um, in the bottom left, if any of you um, like to go boating at all, you're probably familiar with this species, which is zebra mussel. Um, I guess they were pulling a car out of a lake somewhere, but um, you, you can see that there's some sort of substance on this car that they were pulling out, and that is completely covered with zebra mussels. Zebra mussels um, are one of the worst invasive species for our aquatic ecosystems, and the big problem that they cause is that they are filter feeders. And there's so many of them that they're sucking all of the nutrients out of the water column, um, not leaving really anything else for any of our other native species. And they've completely changed our food webs. And on the right here is a um, picture of a forest somewhere down south of kudzu. Now, thankfully, kudzu is not really a problem here in New York um, because it's a little too cold here for them. But down south, kudzu is a huge problem. And you could just see here, this entire forest area right like all these trees all of the ground is just covered in this vine right and without any natural um predators right like kudzu is able to spread just completely out of control and if you are a plant or an animal who's living in this forest right you're not having a good time <laughs> so i think these three pictures give us a really good sense of the totality of damage that invasive species can cause but what is an invasive species, right? Like what is it about these three species that make them so particularly um, harmful to our ecosystems? And what do they share amongst themselves that other species don't have? Well, if we're gonna define an invasive species, um, we, we have a pretty good definition for it. Basically an invasive species is any species that is not native to an ecosystem and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic, environmental harm, or harm to human health. And generally with invasive species, we're talking about the same sets of characteristics, right? We're talking about species that have very high reproductive rates, right? So if any of you maybe watched like a Planet Earth documentary and you know David Attenborough is talking about a, um, a cactus that maybe flowers once every 10 years, this is not invasive species. Invasive species are very capable of pumping out a lot of eggs or seeds or whatever means of reproduction very, very quickly, often much faster than native species. They're very aggressive. They can just grow really quickly. Um, and a lot of the times they don't have any natural predators. So you have these huge populations and um, rising and there's nothing to keep those populations in check. And this is usually because invasive species, um, we like to think of as being sort of the potato chips of the natural world. Um, very often native spe invasive species, excuse me, um, have very low nutritional value. So native predators don't really go after these. They'll instead go after the uh, much more nutritious native species. And the final point I'd like to make here, which I think is really the most important one and definitely um, intersects with um, talking about trails tonight, is that invasive species are really, really good at taking advantage of human disturbance. And what do I mean by human disturbance? Well, when we're talking about human disturbance, we're talking about changing the natural landscape, right? We're talking about building roads. We're talking about building houses and suburbs. And it's these areas where our native species really tend to struggle. And it's these areas where invasive species 
drive, right? So you think along, um, if, you, if you know what Phragmites looks like, if you're familiar with it at all, you're driving along a roadside, you'll often see Phragmites just carpet the area, right? It's a very uh, particularly bad invasive species. Invasive species you'll often see growing in cracks in your driveway or on the edge of your lawn. Um, these areas that are disturbed by humans are just the perfect place for invasive species to come in. And trails are a part of that. Invasive species often, when we see them invading a forested setting, they like to come in on the trails. And we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics as to why this happens a little bit later. But trails, if you're gonna be looking for invasive species in the forest, are probably the first place you're gonna be looking at. Um, but with that in mind, how does this even happen, right? Like how does um, like gypsy moth from Europe or uh, kudzu from Japan even get here in the first place? Well, invasive species can be introduced for a myriad of reasons. Um, many times they're just simply introduced by accident, right? As a consequence of international trade, we have cars, boats, and planes crisscrossing different countries and continents, and different species can come along with that. But a lot of times, invasive species are introduced intentionally. Um, invasive species can be introduced through the pet trade or with landscaping plants, and they will eventually escape out into the wild. And generally, when we're talking about invasive species, um, at least for our purposes here in upstate New York and on the East Coast, we're talking about species that are coming from either Eastern Asia or from Europe. And there's two reasons for this. One is that these two regions of the world are generally the places where we in the United States have the most ties to, right? The, these are the places where we're visiting as tourists the most. These are the places where we have the most trade. So there's naturally just a lot of crisscrossing between us and Europe and Asia. But the other reason is that these are the areas of the world that are the most similar climactically to the Eastern United States, right? So these are areas where we're talking about species that are going to be able to survive in upstate New York winter, right? If you introduce something from maybe Australia, odds of it establishing here in it, you know, where we have winter lasting from, you know, like November to April um, would be pretty difficult, right? And when we talk about these introductions, the cost of invasive species, um, affect a lot of different areas. Economically, we're talking about impacts on agriculture, on recreation, on uh, trade and tourism. Environmentally, we're seeing huge impacts on biodiversity, uh, natural processes, aesthetics, and even on human health too. Um, we're talking about impacts on soil and water quality, impacts on um, flooding, and even in some cases, diseases and illnesses. And we can put specific um, numbers on these costs. These aren't just abstract concepts. Invasive species worldwide have directly contributed to hundreds of species extinctions, particularly on islands. Um, and the decline of thousands more, which we're really seeing a lot here in upstate New York. Um, and in the US alone, if you want to put a dollar price tag on this, we can do that too. Annually, we spend $120 billion a year controlling invasive species. So this is a really, really big economic problem that we have. And a lot of the times, um, the biggest problems that we have, it comes with uh, managing invasive species, is that we don't know where they are. <laughs> um, it might seem a little silly, but a lot of the times invasive species can spread um, relatively undetected and much more quickly than we are able to keep up with. And this is really where the basis of the trail survey sort of comes in. And we could sort of generalize how a particular invasive species spreads um, through what's, what's called the invasion curve. The invasion curve is basically a generalization of how a given invasive species will spread over time, right? So basically, um, if we look to the left here, you'll see uh, where this blue arrow is coming in, that's when a species is originally introduced. And so when a species is first introduced, the area they infested is going to be relatively small, right? Because they just got here. They haven't established that population yet, which means that the control costs of actually removing that invasive species are going to be naturally low. Um, but the longer and longer it takes for us to find this species and then actually do something about it means that the area it infests and the more the damage that it causes increases as well as the cost of actually removing it. And the problem is, is that we usually don't end up discovering 
a population of invasive species until it started reaching the maybe containment area and sometimes even the long-term management part of the curve here, where the invasive species has infested such a large area and the costs of removing it are so enormously large that any hope of actually eradicating it is completely gone. So what we're trying to do here with the Finger Lakes Trail Survey is we are trying to expand the number of people who are looking for invasive species so that we catch them when their populations are so small and we can actually still remove them. And so we can avoid getting into these long-term problems of um, the control costs being too high to remove them. And so that's where the shell survey comes in, right? So you could be just like this guy, all you need is a phone um, surveying out in the trail. It's, it's a really easy program to take part in. Um, and so I'm gonna walk you guys through the steps of how the trail survey actually works. So the basic goal of the trail survey is what I just mentioned before, right? Expanding our footprint for the number of um, different people who are looking for species so we can report them and deal with them um, more quickly than we already are. Anyone with a smartphone or a tablet and who has the ability to walk on a trail can take part in this um, survey. And you can do it wherever you'd like. Any trail near you, it we completely uh, leave it up to you if you'd like to participate as to um, when and where you'd like to survey. Um, and the basis is, is that we ask volunteers um, to survey at least three times during the year um, in June, July, and August for a set list of invasive species. And I'll we'll talk a little bit more about the invasive species that we look for later. Now, I know we're starting, starting to get a little bit later into June, but honestly, um, you don't need to go out three times in the summer. If you just go on one trail and take one point, that is um, a huge benefit for us, right? We're, we're not asking, we, we think of this as you guys are doing us a favor. Um, and so while we, prefer our volunteers to survey once a month during June, July, and August. Um, you know, you, you could go out whenever you'd like. We, any points, any more data that we can collect is really a, a huge benefit for us. And why survey trails, right? I talked about before that invasive species are usually found on roadsides, they're usually found in suburban areas. Well, we see invasive species invade trails a lot of the time because Trails are frequently disturbed. These are disturbed environments that invasive species love to come in. And this is because we're seeing a lot of human foot traffic, a lot of clearing of brush on the sides of the trails. And what this causes is um, what we call in ecology, the edge effect, where basically the edges of an ecosystem, as you can see in the diagram on the right here, have different environmental characteristics than the interior of that ecosystem, right? So here in New York, we're talking about forests and it's usually the edges of forests have different conditions that are more suitable to invasive species than the deep interior of the forest, right? So we're talking about um, warmer temperatures, more sunlight, lower moisture. Our native species are very well adapted to living in the interior of the forest, right? May not so much on the forest edge and so, Invasive species, usually when we do see them along um, our natural areas, we're gonna see them on, on trail sides. So it's actually a perfect um, opportunity for to get people who are frequently hiking on trails to look for invasive species because that's where the invasive species are most likely going to be found. Um, and this picture I think really does a good job of showing how an invasive species can really take over a trail. Um, believe it or not, this is a trail. Uh, if you look towards the bottom here, you could see just the faintest hints of a brown dirt path going in here. But be, this is an area that has been completely taken over by Japanese knotweed. Japanese knotweed is one of the worst invasive species that um, we have here in New York, and they can form these really, really big, dense thickets. And because the trail sides have these um, different environmental conditions, Japanese knotweed here has just been able to crowd out everything. Um, and this other picture I have here does a really good job of showing um, how bad of, of a thicket, at least specifically Japanese knotweed, can form, right? So if we're, if we're thinking about, we want to protect um, our ecosystems where we're hiking, right? We want these to be really healthy ecosystems. Just imagine you are some native plant species and your seed falls into the Japanese knotweed thicket. 
there's no hope for you, right? There, there is no way in this thicket you are going to be able to grow fast enough, get the sunlight you need, get the nutrients you need to be able to compete with Japanese knotweed on the scale, right? So when we're talking about um, invasive species and identifying them and reporting them and removing them, um, we're talking about making these areas better um, for our, um, our native species. And that would make the hiking experience all the more um, better for us as well. So for the trail survey, um, there's three basic steps to being able to participate. One is identifying, just learning how to identify the different invasive species that we have out there on the trail. For the most part, these are going to be invasive plant species, just because here in New York State, um, that's what we're going, that's what we see for the most part on along our trail sides. We have invasive insects and some invasive diseases that we'd like to keep an eye on as well. But for the most part, we don't really have a huge problem with invasive birds or mammals or reptiles. So really, for the most part, we're looking at plants. These are these are the big drivers of invasive species here. Um, once you learn how to identify invasive species, you then go out and survey. So it's as simple as just taking your phone. Um, and there is an app that we're going to talk about later that you would download on your phone. And um, you go out and you survey and you look for the different invasive species that you can find along trail sides. And then you report those species, right? So it was the app I talked about on my on your phone, um, you download what's called the IMAP Invasives uh, mobile app. And you, with that app, um, it's basically a database that compiles all of the invasive species observations recorded by anybody in all of New York State. And invasive species managers like us at the Finger Lakes Prism and people at the DEC and other organizations have access to this map. So you can help build the database of where all the invasive species are in New York State. And that really helps us prioritize what areas can we tackle to remove invasive species before they get out of control. So I'm going to walk you guys through each of the three different steps as to um, taking part in the program. Um, and first, we're going to talk about identification and how to identify invasive species. Um, so there's a lot of different invasive species out there on the trail. Um, and I'm not going to cover, just for the sake of time, all the different invasive species that we generally ask people to um, survey for tonight. But I am going to go through some of the heavy hitters. And um, if, you do, if you would like to take part in this um, survey later on, uh, I could pass you along some uh, materials as to how to learn how to identify all the other um, invasive species that we generally ask participants to identify. Um, so let's just get started, let's dive right into it. Um, so for the most part, we're gonna, like I said, we're going to be talking about the species that you're most commonly going to be seeing on trail sides. And if you have been on a trail lately, odds are you have probably have seen swallowwort. Now swallowwort um, is actually two invasive species, but the thing about swallowworts are that the black and pale swallowworts there, they're just so similar that we usually just end up lumping them into just one group and we just call them the swallowworts. So swallowworts, so they are a vine. You often, you could see them climbing on different plants, but they don't necessarily have to grow on other plants. You could just see them as a weed growing on the forest floor as well. Um, originally, they are native to Europe, Europe. And the big danger with swallowworts is that they are actually um, close relatives of our native milkweeds. And what ends up happening is that uh, monarch butterflies will often mistake swallowwort for milkweeds. And once those caterpillars hatch on a swallowwort, turns out swallowwort is actually toxic to monarch butterfly caterpillars. So we've seen huge impacts on our monarch caterpillar um, populations because of swallowworts that are out competing our native milkweeds. So when it comes to identifying swallowwort, uh, you're going to be looking for um, sort of a viney, weedy sort of plant. And it's going to have these very long, uh, tapered and pointed leaves. And the, the arrangement of those leaves on the plant is actually really important. When, we're, when it comes to uh, leaves and plant identification, there are two uh, ways leaves can grow. Excuse me, <coughs> losing my voice there. There are two ways leaves generally grow on plants. <clears throat> There's an alternate arrangement, right? So that will be um, when a leaf will grow on one side of the stem and then it will grow on the other side of the stem and 
then another leaf will grow on the other side of the stem, right? So you can see this picture here. We have one leaf on the right side, then one leaf on the left side. Then if you can imagine the stem going further, you have, you have one on the right, then one on the left, one on the right, one on the left. It alternates. With swallowwort, and most plants usually don't have this, swallowwort has what's called an opposite leaf arrangement, which means every time there is a leaf on one side, let's say the right side of a stem, there is going to be another leaf directly opposite it on the left side of the stem. Not that many plants have this, but swallowwort does. So this is a really um, key feature if you're going to be identifying swallowwort out in the fields. Uh, the other ways you can identify swallowwort are they'll have these really strange looking um, brown uh, star shaped flowers. They don't really look like anything else that you'd see out there. And as they are in the milkweed family, um, they will have um, long skinny uh, seed pods, sort of like how milkweed does, but much more thinner. And this is a close up on the, um, the flowers that I mentioned before. You can see how they are uh, star shaped five different points and they're brown. And again, they just, they look really strange, not like anything else that you, you're really used to seeing out in the show, right? Our next species is a species of grass, uh, Japanese silk grass, otherwise known as Nepalese brown top. Uh, this species is um, really bad because it's, as a grass, it can form really dense thickets on the forest floor. And it really just has, does a really good job of pushing out uh, native plants that we find in forests. Japanese silk grass, now I am, I personally don't like identifying grass species. It's something I personally struggle with a lot. Uh, but thankfully, Japanese silk grass is a lot easier to identify than a lot of other um, grass species. The two main characteristics you're going to be looking for if you think you've found Japanese silk grass is, uh, first thing is you're going to be looking for the, uh, the leaf blade. And along the leaf blade, you'll see this really distinctive um, white stripe that might sometimes even be a little off center. Uh, this white stripe is unique to Japanese silk grass. You're not going to find it on any other native or invasive grass species. Um, and this is something that I've been told by my supervisor before. Uh, if you think you have found Japanese silk grass and you do see that white stripe, try pulling it out of the ground. Um, Japanese silk grass is comically easy to pull out of the ground. I've, I've been told by my supervisor that a two-year-old could pull out Japanese stilt grass. They have very, very shallow root systems. So this is not going to be um, something that's going to really stay in the ground. You could maybe even kick it out of the ground. It's, it's that loosely connected to the soil. So if you see a white stripe or um, something that comes out of the soil really easily, odds are you were probably looking at uh, Japanese silk grass. Japanese knotweed. Um, and if you've noticed, as I talked about before, invasive species usually coming from East Asia or Europe, right? A lot of these species are going to have a name like Japanese stiltgrass, Japanese knotweed, or European gypsy moth or things like that. Japanese knotweed is, um, as we, we talked about it before, this is a plant that could really form huge, huge thickets. And the first thing that I notice when I'm looking at Japanese knotweed, and um, these pictures don't really do it justice, is that the stem of Japanese knotweed looks almost exactly like bamboo. Now, Japanese knotweed is not in any way at all related to bamboo. They're very distant, uh, leaf far apart on the tree of life. But superficially, the stalk of Japanese knotweed looks a lot like bamboo, and you can actually um, pretty easily break it in half and it'll be hollow on the inside. So that's sort of the first thing that catches my eye when I see, when I think I see Japanese knotweed. Uh, the other main characteristics are that Japanese, Japanese knotweed has these very big, almost circular um, leaves. And these leaves in person are huge. We're talking about a leaf that is maybe hand-sized or bigger. So this is going to be one of the biggest leaves of any plant that you're going to see on the trail. And um, generally when Japanese knotweed is flowering, they're gonna have these really white, um, sort of wispy flowers. So they'll, they'll sort of come out in these very long, um, like wispy lines growing out from the plant. And it gives, this, gives it almost a sort of um, airy appearance as you can see in the, the picture here on the roadside. Japanese knotweed um, doesn't just grow along trails. It pretty much can grow in any area. In fact, um, in the parking lot outside of my apartment building, 
um, there's a whole colony of Japanese knotweed out there. So this is a plant you could really find pretty much anywhere, not just in forested settings. Garlic mustard. Garlic mustard is maybe the most unique plant we're going to be talking about um, today. So garlic mustard is originally native to Europe and it's actually an edible plant. It was specifically brought over here to North America to um, be a food source. I've never eaten it before, but I've heard that you can ground up the leaves and make it into some sort of um, pesto. Uh, so you could, yeah, hey, if you're, if you're the type of person who likes to forage, maybe this is a thing for you. Um, Garlic mustard, as its name implies, um, with it being a food source, is a really fun plant to identify because the uh, easiest way you can identify it is just simply taking a leaf off the plant, crushing it between your fingers, and if you give it a smell, it actually smells like a garlicky, must mustardy sort of odor. Um, garlic mustard, unlike any of the other plants we're talking about, is a biennial, just like carrots. So um, it's not an annual where it only lives for one growing season and it's not a perennial where it keeps growing back every growing season. It only lives for two growing seasons, specifically two. So garlic mustard divides its life into two distinct phases then. The first year of its life, garlic mustard will be um, sort of as we see here in the picture on the top. It'll grow these cir circular leaves and it'll just be really um, short, close to the ground, maybe just a few inches off. And the, first, the whole point of its first year of life is that garlic mustard is um, taking as much energy as it possibly can from uh, the sun. It's storing all that energy in its roots. And it's saving that energy for its second year where it'll just shoot up and it'll maybe hit two, three, sometimes even four feet in height along this huge stalk. And it's really interesting because in its second year, while um, it'll actually grow a different uh, leaf shape than in its first year. In its first year, garlic mustard will have this very circular shape. In its second year, garlic mustard will have this triangular shape to its leaves. And in both years, uh, the leaves will have this really deep veination. The veins of the leaf are very prominent. So if you see a plant with triangular shaped leaves, odds are it's, excuse me, it's probably garlic mustard. Now it's a little too late to look for the flowers. Um, but usually when garlic mustard flowers, you're gonna see these little white flowers on the top of the stalks. Garlic mustard is one of the um, earliest invasive species that comes out. So generally you're gonna be looking for these guys, April, May. Um, by the time June comes around, other invasive species start taking over, but you could definitely still see garlic mustard out there. Another interesting thing about garlic mustard is that um, while it is uh, edible to humans, it is, poisonous to other plants. It has what's called allelopathy. Basically what garlic mustard does is uh, it excretes toxic chemicals into the soil to actually kill other plants that are growing near it. So we see a lot of um, big problems with garlic mustard where they've pretty much poisoned out all of the native plants that would normally be growing with them. So um, deep venation, smelly leaves, um, and circular and triangular shaped leaves is going to be how you're going to be able to uh, identify garlic mustard. Japanese honeysuckle. This is a shrub uh, very commonly planted as a ornamental plant, just like what we talked about before with, um, oh gosh, uh, swallowwort, excuse me. Um, Japanese honeysuckle has opposite leaves. And for any of the plants where we don't mention their um, leaf arrangement, they're, they're going to have alternate leaves. That's usually the default for uh, most plant species. But Japanese honeysuckle has opposite leaves. Uh, for the most part, when you're identifying Japanese honeysuckle, you're gonna be looking for a big shrub that has that opposite leaf arrangement. And you're gonna look for these um, really small oval shaped leaves, um, maybe about the size of your thumb. Uh, and these really prominent white trumpet shaped flowers. I believe the flowers are already gone at this point in the year. But if you're going to be identifying these uh, maybe later on in the spring, you're gonna see these white, very prominent trumpet shaped flowers. Um, the, really the key thing when it comes to identifying a Japanese honeysuckle is the twig. So if you take the twig of any Japanese honeysuckle, whether it's um, living or dead, 
if you, you break it in half, that twig will actually be hollow on the inside. This is a characteristic that is pretty much unique to Japanese honeysuckle. So if, if you think you're on the trail and you, you, you find, you think you found Japanese honeysuckle, uh, take a twig, break it in half, and if it's hollow, it's Japanese honeysuckle. Japanese barberry. Uh, this is a shrub that, again, is very commonly planted as an ornamental plant. Usually when you do see Japanese uh, barberry, you're going to see it as um, with this sort of red purplish leaf coloration. But when they escape into the wild, as they frequently do, uh, they'll revert back to the natural uh, green coloration that they have. Japanese barberry is an interesting plant because it doesn't have an opposite or an alternate leaf arrangement. Um, it has what's called a whorl leaf arrangement, where basically all of the leaves on a uh, twig for Japanese barberry will grow in a circle sort of radiating at a central point. If you, if you look at this uh, middle picture here, you could sort of get a sense for that. Japanese barberry, if you're going to ID it, uh, make sure you're keeping your distance because Japanese barberry has a lot of thorns on it. That's probably going to be your first sign that what you're looking at might be Japanese barberry. Um, if you see those world leaves, take a note of their size. The leaves on Japanese barberry are smaller than any of the other plants we're talking about today. We're talking like fingernail sized leaves. They're very, very small. Um, and if you are looking for Japanese barberry out on the trail later in the year, you're usually going to see these um, red sort of oblong shaped berries. This is pretty unique to Japanese barberry. There's not really any other plants uh, you're going to find out there that have berries like that. So you're looking for Japanese barberry, small leaves in whorls with thorns are going to be the key characteristics. Um, yeah, so multiflora rose. This is another thorny shrub. Um, the, again, very commonly planted landscaping plant. Um, I just gave a uh, guided hike last week and we saw a huge um, thicket, a multiflora rose that had these really prominent white flowers. And, you know, you can't blame people for bringing them over because their flowers really are beautiful. Um, but the first thing you're going to be looking for, and if you go out on any trail today and you see a multiflora rose, you're definitely going to see these really white showy flowers. Very, very prominent on the shrub. Um, these flowers, once they mature later in the year, they will form these, um, these little res ber red berries that we call uh, rose hips. All rose species, whether native or invasive, um, form these little hips as their, um, their fruit. Look for this as a very um, important sign if you think you found multiflora rose, because these hips, even after they mature in late summer, early fall, will remain on the plant throughout the winter into the spring. So oftentimes you can find um, older rose hips on a plant. But the really the key identifying feature for multiflora rose is if you take a look at the leaf, and this is a compound leaf. So each one of these little, um, what appears to be its own leaf is actually a leaflet. This whole structure in this picture is one single leaf. So if you take a look at, at a leaf and you look at the base of it, you'll see these little, uh, little thorns popping out. This feature is unique to multiflora rose, whether native or an invasive rose species, um, those little thorns or horns, it, because they are kind of horn shaped, popping out of the base of the leaf are going to be the, um, the main characteristic if you're going to be identifying multiflora rose. Uh, leaf disease, this is a new one. Um, it is a really scary one. So right now we, uh, have a lot of um, beaches that have been really heavily impacted by um, beach bark disease. But in just the past couple of years, we've discovered beach leaf disease too. Um, we know very, very little at the moment about beach leaf disease. It was only discovered in Ohio in 2018, and it is now moving eastward uh, into the Finger Lakes region. And I believe it was just detected for the first time in our area uh, last year. As far as what causes beech leaf disease, we're not really sure. Um, the current thinking is it's some microscopic nematode, basically a microscopic worm that was introduced from Asia. We have absolutely no idea how it got here, uh, but this is a really scary uh, disease for our beech trees because they've already been so badly hit by beech bark disease. And this might be the disease that just knocks them out entirely. Um, if, you're if you're on the trail and you see beech leaves that look a little bit strange, um, definitely take a closer look. 
the main signs of beech leaf disease are that when you're on the trail and you see a beech leaf, you're going to see these really dark um, striping along the leaf. Like this is going to be in the tissue between the leaf veins. Um, and you could see this phenomenon really well if you are looking at the leaves um, underneath the sun, it really pops out at you. Um, but that is the main sign of beech leaf disease. Unfortunately, at the moment, we really just don't know how how it spreads or what sort of long-term impacts it's gonna cause, but this is definitely something that I encourage all of our hikers to keep an eye out for. It's super, super important that we get a handle on this. Uh, Tree of Heaven. So Tree of Heaven has a really interesting story. Tree of Heaven was originally brought in from East Asia in the 1700s. And while pretty much all of the other invasive species we talked about um, have been really heavy hitters and have spread very fast, very quickly, Oddly enough, we haven't really seen that with Tree of Heaven. See, the thing is, there are hundreds of invasive plant species here in North America, but a lot of them aren't really invading lands things on a landscape scale as what we sort of see with, with Japanese knotweed, right? Um, Tree of Heaven was one of those invasive species that for a long time really wasn't at the top of anyone's priority list. Um, because it wasn't really spreading to our natural ecosystems. It was mostly being confined to urban areas and um, maybe some suburban areas sometimes. Usually you'd see these guys growing in like parking lots. Hardly a species that's going to be threatening, threatening our native ecosystems. Uh, but the search and removal of Tree of Heaven has really taken a, a dramatic rise in importance over the past few years because it is a host for the next invasive species we're going to talk about, the spotted lanternfly. Um, but for the most part, so we, we are encouraging people to look for Tree of Heaven now because it is really going to be playing a big role in the spread of spotted lanternfly, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, in upstate New York. When it comes to identifying Tree of Heaven, um, for the most part, it's going to be looking similar to our native sumac species. And I generally encourage people to look for two different characteristics when they're trying to identify Tree of Heaven. There's a lot of other characteristics that you can use to tease apart Tree of Heaven from other sumac species. But uh, just for the, the uh, sake of uh, clarity, I like to focus on two different uh, characteristics. So with these two pictures here on the right, is Tree of Heaven, and on the left are our native sumac species. And the first thing we're going to talk about are the, um, the leaves. So both of these uh, trees have compound leaves, where each one of these individual structures is a leaflet that grows along um, the stem that forms a single leaf. On our native sumac species, the edges of these leaflets, what we call the margin, uh, will be jagged or toothed. On Tree of Heaven, the invasive species, these margins are going to be smooth. They're going to just go straight across. You're not going to see any teeth on them, except for the base. You'll see one single um, tooth pop out towards the bottom. But for the most part, these leaflets are going to have smooth leaf margins. So that's characteristic number one. Characteristic number two that you're going to be on the lookout for are the seeds. Sumacs have these really odd looking seed structures. Basically they will grow these, um, these upright red, bright red fuzzy uh, seed clusters. And these seed clusters, uh, while you're gonna see them growing most prominently in spring and summer, they'll actually stay on the trees throughout the fall and even in the middle of winter. So it's actually a really good way of being able to identify um, sumac species at any time of the year. Tree of Heaven does not have these uh, fuzzy seed clusters. They have seeds in what's called samaras. So if you are, if any, if any of you are familiar with um, like maple seedlings, where they have those little helicopter seeds, uh, that's the same seed structure that Tree of Heaven has. And these seed structures um, are only going to occur on the tree uh, late summer, early fall. They're not going to last throughout the year like sumac seeds are. So the leaf margins and the seeds are going to be the two main characteristics that you're looking for to tease apart Tree of Heaven from our native sumacs. And they can look very similar. So that's why I'm stressing this so much. But the reason why we're stressing Tree of Heaven in the first place is because of spotted lanternfly. This, 
out of any invasive species on this list is public enemy number one right now. Spotted lanternfly was first detected in Philadelphia in 2014. And within the seven years since then has spread to 10 states, including unfortunately New York state. It's originally native to China. Um, and a big problem with spotted lanternfly is that it could simply spread a lot faster than we are able to keep up with. There are three different populations in New York State right now. Um, one sort of in the Catskills, Lower Hudson Valley area, one in uh, Long Island in New York City, and the final one in Tompkins County in Ithaca. Um, I actually just got an email yesterday saying that they have confirmed um, spotted lanternfly nymphs grow, uh, growing in, in Ithaca this year. So anyone who is in the Ithaca area, please keep a lookout for spotted lanternfly. Um, Spotted lanternfly, thankfully, though, is maybe one of the easiest species on this list to identify. Um, there are no insects really in North America that resemble spotted lanternfly in any way, shape, or form. Um, spotted lanternfly has these really distinctive life phases. So uh, its first life stage when it's a uh, in an egg stage, and they will lay their eggs on pretty much anything, usually trees. Um, and that's where Tree of Heaven comes in. Uh, Tree of Heaven back in China is the preferred host of spotted lanternfly. So that's why we are really stressing people look out for Tree of Heaven because it is helping spotted lanternfly invade North America even easier than it already would be. Um, so we're looking out for these egg masses and these egg masses will be laid on trees like Tree of Heaven, but they can be laid on other trees like maples and walnuts too. Uh, but a lot of times they'll even be laid on rusted metal and even cars. And that's why spotted lanternfly can spread so quickly because it can lay its eggs on your car. You can drive away hours to a new location and then you just establish a new spotted lanternfly population. Generally, the egg masses are going to have this sort of putty like appearance and they'll have this um, grayish, almost purplish at times uh, color to them. Once those eggs hatch, and this is the um, stage that they are currently in right now in the early spring. They're going to be very small, basically ant sized, and they're gonna be uh, black with white spots. As they get older and they get bigger throughout the summer, uh, they will grow um, much larger in size and they will get red striping down their backs. And, and in the, both of these stages, uh, they don't have wings. So they're mostly just hopping around on different plants. And eventually, uh, once sort of late summer comes around, the spotted lanternfly nymphs will mature into fully fledged adults. They will grow their wings and they'll get these really just funky looking um, pink wings with black spots on them. Um, and then they'll start flying around and they'll be mating and starting the next generation of spotted lanternflies for next year. Um, the adults are really big. They're one of the biggest insects that you're going to see out on the trail. Uh, oftentimes they could hit an inch bigger than an inch long. So they really will pop out at you um, if you do happen to come across them. The big problem with spotted lanternfly though is its economic impact. Its environmental impact is likely going to be um, a cause for concern. But other than Tree of Heaven, the next two preferred hosts for um, spotted lanternfly are grapevines and apple trees, which here in the Finger Lakes um, really is a recipe for disaster. So I implore um, all of you, if there's anything you can take away from today, please, 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 please look for spotted lanternfly. Um, out of the three populations in New York State that I mentioned at the beginning, two of them were found by volunteers. Um, so you guys can have a really big impact if you're on the lookout for spotted lanternfly. And uh, if you are having trouble out there on the trail, um, I try to identify in, uh, invasive species. There are a lot of great tools out there that you can use. The tool that I like to use the most is called Seek. Uh, this is an app for your phone made by iNaturalist. And basically the way Seek works is that um, you open up the app, you point your phone's camera towards um, a plant or an animal, and it will do its best guess to identify what that um, organism is for you. And it, it works pretty well. I tried it on my ferret. Uh, walnut and it correctly identified him as a European polecat. So um, I, if you if you are someone who doesn't know how to identify um, plant or animal species really well, I would definitely recommend looking at Seek. 
that's sort of the, um, the identification portion of how the trail survey works. Uh, the next step is actually surveying. And this is pretty easy. So basically the way that we ask our participants to survey is that you start on the trail or at a desired point and you uh, basically imagine an imaginary circle around you with a radius of 50 feet. You are going to identify and map the invasive species in that area, right? So I see um, honeysuckle there, multiflora rose there. And using the IMAP invasive species app, you're gonna report the size of the infestation that you see. So whether it's occupying just the, you know, maybe half an acre or over an acre and the distribution of those invasive species. So whether you're just seeing a few plants scattered here or there, or you're seeing a huge dense thicket of plants. And once you record those invasives, you just move on to the next 50 foot location. You just keep working your way down the trail until you reach a point where you feel like you're satisfied. And this is just a good visualization of that um, imaginary circle that um, I mentioned earlier. And then that's pretty much all it is when it comes down to surveying. And then once you um, have surveyed the area, you're gonna report those observations with the IMAP invasive species app on your phone. Um, and you would then upload these species into the database that we can then use. Super helpful, super important for us. Um, and we do have trainings. If you are interested in participating in this program, we have a training on how to use the um, IMAP invasive species app and how to take part in the general invasive species program up on our YouTube channel. And if you're interested, I could pass along those, um, those video links to you. But if you are interested, um, it's really as simple for reporting as making an account uh, with New York IMAP invasive species, downloading the app, and then joining the Finger Lakes Prism Volunteer Trail Survey. And then once you do that, you um, mark all of the points you take as part of being our Volunteer Trail Survey project. And then that makes it so that all of the points you take will be uploaded as being part of our project and not just as a generic point. Um, so does this even work? As I mentioned before, um, yeah, it actually does. Two of the three spotted lanternfly populations in New York State were found, not by professionals like me, but just by regular volunteers who were keeping an eagle eye out there. So you guys surveying on the Finger Lakes Trail or any other trails out there can be the person who discovers a new invasive species or the, a new population of invasive species that could save us years of work and possibly um, millions of dollars in economic damage and preventing um, environmental damage to our ecosystems. Um, it's not too late to get started, even though I mentioned before that we um, ask volunteers to survey in June. Um, we have our past trainings up on YouTube. Um, feel free to watch any of them um, there, our YouTube channel. And even if you don't get a chance to go out uh, serving on a trail in June, um, really, like I said before, if, if you could just take one point on um, any trail, that's just a huge benefit to us, right? Because that's a, that's a point, that's a data point that we didn't have before. We now have more information that we can then leverage to make better decisions about how we can tackle invasive species. Um, we have a Facebook group as well uh, under the name Finger Lakes Prism Trail Survey, where uh, people can ask questions about different invasive species that they're finding. You could post pictures of the species that you've seen along the trail and ask other people and you can compare results. So if you're interested, you can um, certainly join that as well. And um, you can always email me at gallo at hws.edu if you have any questions. And um, I would just like to leave tonight just giving us a final overview as to what we're really talking about here, just sort of grounding us. Um, because really invasive species are a huge problem. And there are a lot of species, uh, a lot of invasive species beyond the ones that we talked about tonight um, that have caused a lot of damage in New York and uh, North America. And these are all species that, um, we have lost the battle against, unfortunately, right? We've lost most of our ash trees, emerald ash borer. Uh, we've lost 90 to 95% of our bat population from white nose syndrome. Um, in many, many cases, I, I really hate to say it, but invasive species have won. Um, and in some cases, your um, invasive species have won so dramatically that we start thinking of them as native species. Um, so, I ask each and every one of you 
who has come tonight, and I really thank you for that, where um, if you would like to be a part of the solution for invasive species, um, a great way to do that is to take part in our uh, trail survey pro program. So thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot them down in the chat box below. And yeah, once again, I, I, I really uh, thank each and every one of you for coming. It's, it's great to hear that um, so many people are interested in invasive species. All right, Matt, there's one question in the chat. It says, can garlic mustard chemical be used against Japanese knotweed? Can the garlic mustard chemical? That is a really interesting idea. I don't know if um, the chemical has been synthesized in any way. Um, the problem with a lot of invasive species is that they could just grow so quickly that I don't know if Japanese knotweed would frankly be that affected by garlic mustard growing near it. And if you are if you are going to be growing garlic mustard to um, remove Japanese knotweed, then you're kind of just replacing one invasive species for another there. So I don't know if you'd really be helping things out too much. Any other questions? Yeah, so we, um, we are looking for any um, points taken in the um, entire 17 county area that I mentioned before. So it's not just specifically the Finger Lakes Trail, although if you'd like to do the Finger Lakes Trail, um, by all means, go ahead. But we're re really looking for um, any trail in um, the Finger Lakes area. And this doesn't have to be like a trail in the woods. This could just be a trail at your local park. We're really looking for um, anything and anywhere. Yeah, I mean, if you'd like to serve on private lands, it could definitely help us give a, um, a better sense of where the invasive species are. So if you'd like to um, just take some points in your backyard, that's totally fine with us too. How do I get that from you? Um, do we have, Christy, do we have like an email list for all the people who came tonight that yes, I could send this up to you? We do? Okay, yeah, so I will, uh, if, once Chrissy passes that along to me, um, I could uh, blast all that stuff out to you guys um, sometime tomorrow if you're interested. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Matt, for sharing all this wonderful information. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll send an email. You'll be getting an email survey from us. Um, about this presentation and others. And with that, we'll include this information from Matt about how to the next steps. Um, just reading this comment really quick. Hmm. Oh. That's an intro. I haven't, I, I don't know too much about that. I'll have to do some research into um, to removing Japanese Zawi. Japanese Zawi is really one of the, the hardest invasive species to get rid of. Um, Yes, I'd be interested in learning more about that. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, have a very good night. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thank you all so much for having me. Have a good night, everyone. Right, bye. Bye. Thank you.